Amen and good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning, whether you are worshiping with us in person or if you are worshiping with us online. Good morning and welcome to worship as we gather together in this place. Now, today is a wonderful, joyous celebration because not only are we here to worship, but we also have a baptism of little Abigail. And so we are thrilled to be able to baptize her this morning. And so now, as all of our hearts and our minds are joined together, let us gather in a moment of prayer. Prayer. Holy and loving God, we turn to you on this day. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Bless us with your power and your peace as we gather together to worship you in this place. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us now and always. We pray this and every prayer through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and together we say, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Please be seated. And now we will begin by lighting our peace candle. Now, friends, when we light this candle, we pray for peace with all of our being. This isn't just an act. This isn't just a lighting of a candle. This is us gathering together spiritually and gathering us together so that we can ask God to bless us with peace and ask God to help us to be instruments of God's peace. So as we join together to light this candle... Will you join your hearts and your minds with me as we pray not only for peace in this world, but as we pray that God can transform our hearts so that we can be instruments of God's peace. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we turn to you today and we ask for peace. We ask for peace that surpasses all human understanding, but we also ask for actual peace. May you help us to be instruments of your peace here in this world. Bless us so that we can be peace and agents of peace in this world. May your peace prevail on earth. 
Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Hi, Bernie, and good morning, kids. Brother, did you know that the other day was Earth Day? I sure did, and in honor of Earth Day, our dad planted 100 saplings this weekend. Wow! 100 saplings? Wait, saplings? What are saplings? Saplings are baby trees. Oh, that's awesome! Trees are really important. They give us clean air, they give us shade to rest under, they give us a nice place to, um, tinkle? Yes, Bernie. Trees are wonderful. They're an, an important part of our environment, and as Christians, it's important that we take care of our environment, because we should always care for the earth that God gave us. Oh, wow. I never thought of it that way. God gave us only one earth, so we should take care of it. Hey, Walter, how do you think we should take care of the earth? I think people should not litter. Littering is really bad. You're right, Walt. Littering is really bad. Not only does littering look bad, but it's also really dangerous for wild animals. They get stuck in trash that's littered, and it can hurt them, or worse. What else do we do to help the environment? I always hear mom and dad tell the kids to turn off the lights. Turning off the lights when we leave the room is very important. Lights left on waste a lot of electricity every day. Wow, planting trees, cleaning up litter, and turning off the lights all seem like great ways for our humans to help God's beautiful earth. Yes, they're all great ideas. Kids, even though Earth Day is over, God still wants us to work on caring for the Earth. Why don't you talk to your parents about ways that you can take care of the Earth today and every day? And kids, you are so great. I know that you're going to think of some really awesome ideas. Thanks for your help, kids, and have a great day. Bye, kids, and see you next week. Good morning. For our litany this morning, when I say we know, please respond with God's love abides in us. As the weak realize their strength, as the poor eat and are satisfied, we know. As the stranger finds a friend, as the family offers forgiveness, we know. As the ends of the earth know of Christ's grace, we know. Amen. And now is the wonderful time where we gather together for the sacrament of baptism. So we have adorable Abigail right here. And as I have told them, Abigail is welcome, I think, to hang out right in the aisle. And I think she'd make us all happy. So she is great. But now I'm going to have Abigail and her parents come forward. It's been, this will be our first in-person baptism that we've had in a while. For our other baptisms, what we've done is we've had them on special days, and you've only seen the videos of the baptism. So this is the first time that we get to have a baptism live during a service, and it is an exciting day. So now let us gather with our hearts and our minds. Members and friends in Christ, we gather now to celebrate the gift of grace in the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is the sacrament through which we are united to Jesus Christ and given part in Christ's ministry of reconciliation. Baptism is the visible sign of an invisible event, the reconciliation of people to God. It shows the death to self and the rising to a life of obedience and praise. <laughs> Uh-oh, she's walking away. <laughs> 
Uh, in baptism, God creates in us the power of forgiveness, the renewal of the Spirit, and the knowledge of the call to be God's people. Out of the water of baptism, we rise with new life, forgiven of sin, and one in Christ, members of Christ's body. Now, parents, do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say we do. Will you encourage your child to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? Say, we will. Will Will you teach your child so that she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, please say, we will. We will. We'll get her when it's time. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and the word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able? If so, please say we do. Do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with Abigail in the Christian faith, to help her to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that she may affirm her baptism? If so, please say we do. do. You can now light the baptismal candle. Friends who are gathered here today, Jesus Christ calls us to make disciples of all the nations and to offer them the gift of grace in the sacrament of baptism. Do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love and your support and your care of the one who is to be baptized today? If so, please say, we do. And now, adults, you are able to look at the screen and we will affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, as soon as we have Abigail back up here, she's the lady of the hour, so that is okay. Miss Abigail, will you help me bless this water? I know that's a funny thing. What am I saying? Can you touch the water as we pour it in? Can you touch the water? Yeah. There we go. We're going to pray over the water. Bless by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. By your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that evil may have no power over them. Create new life in the one to be baptized today that she may rise in Christ. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who always shall be. Now, years from now, when she asks if she was baptized, we can tell her not only was she baptized, but she drank the (laughs) baptismal water as well. Okay, Abigail, I'm going to put some water on your head. Here, can you lean over here, sweetie? I baptize you in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to put a sign on the cross on your forehead. Amen. You, my sweet child, have been baptized. Let's pray for Abigail now. Gracious God, you have filled this world with joy by giving us the gift of Jesus. Bless this child. May she be filled with joy. May she never be ashamed to confess a personal faith in you. In the presence of our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, we pray. Amen. And now let us welcome sweet Abigail to the Christian church. Yes. Good job, sweet girl.
and you can be seated. Amen, and please be seated. Now, I was telling Sue how after the first service that this was the first week, it kind of felt more like normal. It felt a little bit more like normal church, and in the first service, there were more kids here, there were more people here, and now, oddly, the baptism with adorable little Abigail made it feel so much more like normal, because we love having children in this church. We love their adorable, natural natures of being kids, and so I think today was the first time that it felt even more like a little bit of normal. You know that sense that as we're coming back to a little bit of normal. And now we are going to read from the first letter of John. Now here's a really interesting thing. We are going to read 1 John chapter 3 verses 11 through 24. However, we don't actually know who wrote this letter. This letter has no authorship attributed to it. So the reason why 1 John along with 2nd and 3rd John, which may not be written by the same authors either, the reason that they're attributed attributed to the gospel writer of the gospel of John is because there are some similarities, especially as you begin the first letter of John, there are some similarities. So we don't know for sure that this was a letter written by the John the evangelist. However, it still has so much truth and so much power to it. And we know that this letter did circulate from church to church, and it's wonderful. But just a little bit of Bible study information for you. This letter is actually anonymous. And now, if you are ready to hear the word of the Lord, will you please say amen? Amen. We need to be a little bit more like normal, so I'm going to ask that question one more time. If you are ready to hear the word of the Lord, will you please say amen? Amen. 
There we go. That's feeling more like normal. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother and sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who hates the world's goods, or sorry, who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or in speech, but in truth and in action. And by this, we know that we are from the truth and will assure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Holy Spirit that he has given us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Amen. And will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Holy and loving God, we turn to you today. We turn to you today and we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Bless us with your spirit and your power. Bless the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our minds so that all that we do and all that we say can be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So in this letter, even though we don't know for sure who wrote it, in this letter we are told that we should be encouraged as Christians to live good and holy lives. Now the thing that's really interesting is that the early Christians had to, when they were writing letters and they were, when the apostles were teaching others, they had to kind of walk on a thin line. They had to teach Christians how to try to live good and holy lives, but at the same time they didn't want the early Christians to turn into new Pharisees and new priest being all judgmental and, and trying to get everybody to live perfect lives, which they knew were not fully possible. And so in this letter, we get this whole entire message that we are supposed to do our best as followers of Christ to live good lives if we are able. We are supposed to do our best to lead good and living li loving lives. Essentially, in a nutshell, this letter tells us that since we are children, of God, and since we believe in the name of God's Son, which is Jesus, then we should choose to abide in love. And when we abide in love, everything that we do should be an act of love. Every word that we speak should be an act of love. Everything that we participate in should be an act of love. Everything that we do should be an act of love if we do, in fact, abide in God. But how do we do that? How do we do everything out of love? It sounds a lot easier than it really is, doesn't it? How do we do every, make sure that every word that we speak is an act of love? Doesn't that sound impossible sometimes? How do we make sure that, that everything that we do, whether we're at home or out there in the world, how do we make sure that everything that we do is an act of love? It's not really that easy. Now let's start with verse 17 that I want to look at. If we look at this verse 17, if we want to try to ask ourselves this question, how do we make sure that everything that we do is an act of love? Then let's look at this verse right here. It says, how does God's love abide in anyone? who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help. That is a convicting verse there. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Now let's think about what it means for God's love to abide in us. First, I'm going to tell you a story about my friend Jeremy. Now, most of you guys probably remember, those of you who have been here for a while, that not only do, have I had these two golden retrievers who lead us in our children's moment every week, but beforehand, I had two other golden retrievers. Well, the person who got me in the golden retriever, you know, addiction kind of train was actually my friend Jeremy from seminary. I took his golden retriever, Kayla, when he was a military chaplain. But before any of that even happened, Jeremy and I met when we were in seminary, and we came from two very different backgrounds. Backgrounds. I grew up in the north and went straight from high school to college to seminary. Jeremy grew up in the south where he ended up with 13 years in the army and then eventually making his way to seminary before he became a military chaplain. So we were two very different people and yet we had such great love for one another. We became wonderful friends. Now here's what I think it means when God's love abides in us. One day Jeremy and I had had a class together and we were in class in seminary. We had our class together and then we parted ways. I was going home. I lived outside of the city, so I was going to drive home. And Jeremy, he lived in the city. He was uh, probably going to go do something. I sure he, I'm sure he had something planned for the day. I walk my way all the way to the car, and I get to my car, and I'm standing there looking at my car. And what do you think I see? A flat tire, thanks to, you know, those Boston roads. I was like, oh, man, a flat tire. Now, here I was. I think I was like 23, 24 years old at this time. Now, let me ask you, do you think that I knew how to change a flat tire? <laughs> no! No! 
oh, I should have. I did grow up in the middle of nowhere. I did grow up, you know, with a lot of, of different abilities. However, I never once learned how to change a tire. And so there I am standing, staring at my car, looking at this flat tire saying, oh, goodness, what in the world am I going to do now? So what do I do? But I pick up the phone and I call my friend Jeremy. I had just said goodbye to him a little while ago, so I picked up my phone and, and I called my friend Jeremy and I said, hey Jeremy, any chance you know how to change a tire? <laughs> Next thing I know, he is running, not walking, he is running straight towards me down the sidewalk to come and help. He is running right because he knows how to solve my problem and he's a good, faithful follower of Christ and a good friend. Jeremy he probably had things that he had to do that day, but he put them all aside so that not only could he come and change my tire, but he could also teach me how to do it because let's face it, a girl should know how to change a tire. But then he also went in the car with me as I had to drive down to the shop to get a new tire put on because I wasn't going to go through Boston traffic with a donut on my car. He did such an amazing job. When God's love abides in us, we act like Jeremy. When God's love abides in us, if we get a phone call and somebody is in need, we don't walk, but we run to go help them. When God's love abides in us, we do everything in our power to help those in need. That's what it looks like when God's love abides in us. When God's love abides in us, it also looks like the chef of the woman's lunch place, who some of the teenagers and I a few years ago got to meet when we were on our mission trip in the Boston area. Again, Boston. Now this chef at the women's lunch place, this is a woman's day shelter. She used to work at some of the fanciest restaurants all around the city. She worked for some of the fanciest restaurants. I'm sure she had a much more cushier salary at some of her other places. But then she decided that she needed to have a job that made a difference. So she took this job at the woman's lunch place where there she was able to feed women two meals a day. And not only that, but also train people how to cook and work with volunteers every single day day to make sure that all of this was possible and she did it all with a smile on her face because she did it all knowing that what she was doing made a difference in this world. God's love abiding in us means using our gifts and our talents to bless other people. God's love abiding in us looks like a man who sees a homeless man with no shoes and so he takes off his own shoes and he puts them on the man who is homeless because he knows that that man needs his shoes much more than he does and he knows that he can walk home and put on another pair of shoes. That's what it looks like when God's love abides in us. God's love abides in us. Looks like a father embracing his son who comes out to him when he says that he's gay. And the father embracing his son and loving him and being there for him. And when they belong to a church that doesn't welcome his son, he changes to a different church. That's what it looks like when God's love abides in us. God's love abiding in us looks like someone who apologizes for their careless words. Because let's face it, sometimes we try to have God's love abide in us and we fail. And sometimes we say things that we shouldn't say. Can anybody else raise their hand to this? Sometimes we say things that hurt other people. Sometimes we accidentally say these words that hurt other people. God's love abiding in us is realizing that our careless words have hurt somebody else and then listening and apologizing and not being defensive but working to make a difference. God's love abiding in us looks like all of those volunteers of ours. I'm looking at some of you who were in the fellowship hall and in the kitchen yesterday cooking to feed 160 people at our drive through dinner when I'm sure you would have rather done something else on your Saturday. And yet our volunteers were in the kitchen cooking and serving people. That's what it looks like when God's love abides in us. Here's the thing, friends. When people look at us, they should know that we're Christians. But they should know that we're Christians not because of the cross that we wear around our neck. They should know that we're Christian not because uh, of our job or our status in society, but they should know that we are Christians because of the way that we act, because of the love that we share. They should know that we are Christians because not only our words speak truth, but our actions speak truth. Our actions and our words embody Christ. They should know that we are Christians. 
because God abides in us. And we should be so convicted that all of our words and all of our actions should reflect the love of God. But here's the thing. If you were to read through this whole entire third chapter, which is a wonderful chapter, it's going to make you think, though. If you guys were in Bible study this week, you know this chapter will make you think. If you are going to go through this whole entire third chapter, you're going to realize that the author also talks a lot about sin. Sin can be a word that we wrestle with sometimes. But as this author is talking about sin, the reality is... That sin, it's not anything crazy complicated. Sin is anything that's opposed to God's love. Sin is anything that's opposed to the love of God. If the love of God is one thing, then sin is the opposite. Sin is a judgmental spewing, uh, a judgmental person spewing words of hurt, spewing words of hate. Sin is a person who goes around and hurts other people and doesn't care about what the, the ripple effect that that pain leaves. Sin, it's like, I, I, you know me, I'm a visual kind of person. So I think of it as this way. Sin is, I always think of this ripple effect. Sin is like a ripple effect where I turn to you when I say words that hurt you because that is a sin if I'm saying words that hurt you. And then you turn around and you're so hurt that you to say words that hurt. And it travels from one person to the next and one person to the next. Sin is anything that is opposite of God's love. And sin has a ripple effect. Violence is a sin that has a ripple effect. It travels from one person to another person. Sin has a ripple effect, but do you know what is even greater than the sin of violence and hatred? God's love. And while sin has this ripple effect that travels from one person to the next, God's love and God's love acting in all of us is greater than some ripple effect. It's like a great big giant wave because when we love one another, when we abide in God's love, when we act out of God's love, when we are forgiving and caring and selfless, when we act out of God's love, it's not like some little ripple effect, but it's like some gigantic wave, a wave of love that spreads not just from one person to another, but from one community to another. So while sin is the opposite of God's love, here's what we need to know. God's love is greater. God's love is more powerful. Sin is the violence and the hatred that hurts people in this world. But God's love is like an all-consuming force that can wash over all of us. The author says that if we abide in God, then we don't sin. If we abide in God, then we love one another. If we abide in God, then God's love lives within us and God's love is perfected in us. So what does this mean? This means that yes, we have the ability to go out and to run around like people in this world and be filled with, with sin and hatred and violence. We have the ability to go out there into this world and hate. Hate is such a prevalent thing in this world. We have the ability to sin in that way. We have the ability to go out there and to run around and to hate other people, but we don't do it. Even though we have that ability, we choose not to because we choose love. We choose to love one another. We choose to love those who are different from us. We choose to love those who act and look different from us. We choose God's love because when God abides in us, we act not out of hatred and sinfulness and violence, but we act out of love. It's such a simple concept. And yet the world makes it so complicated. It's such a simple concept, and yet so often we get confused about it. What this means is if we act out of love, if we love one another, we're not going to say things to hurt one another. If we love one another, we're not going to say things that are like jabbing a, a dagger in somebody's heart. If we love one another, we're not going to be judgmental and rude and mean and cause hatred in this world. If we love one another, we are going to see each other as brothers and sisters. Even if we don't see each other eye to eye, we are going to learn to see each other as brothers and sisters because that's what we are called to do. So even though there are ripples of hatred because of sin in this world, we, friends, are called to abide in love. We are called to love. We are called people to be people who forgive. We are called to be selfless. 
We are called to give. We are called to serve because we are called to have God abide in us. And when God abides in us, love spreads from all of us. Think about the world we want Abigail to grow up in. Do we want her to grow up in a world that's riddled with hatred? Or do we want her to grow up in a world that is full of love? I'm going to guess everybody's going to say full of love. That means it starts with us. It starts with each and every single one of us to let God abide in us. And then we, with God abiding in us, love one another. And let's join in a moment of prayer. Holy and loving God, we turn to you on this day, not because we have everything figured out, Lord, but because we want you to abide in us, Lord. Lord, abide in us. Live in us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Teach us to be agents of your peace and your love in this world. Help us, Lord, and guide us, Lord, so that we can be agents of your peace. Help us, Lord, and guide us, Lord, so that we can be agents of your love and your justice in this world. Teach us, Lord, to see all others as brothers and sisters. Teach us, Lord, to love one another. And we pray this in every prayer through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time for our offering. Please continue to give online, or if you are in the sanctuary, please drop your donation in the basket at the back of the sanctuary. Let us pray together. Gracious God, may this act of giving transform our hearts and our minds. May you bless these gifts and use them to do your will. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
Now go forth with the love of Christ. Go forth with the blessing and the mercy of Christ. Go forth spreading God's love. Go and be blessed.